Welcome to the Alan Elkan Interviews, an unprecedented window into the minds of some of the most well-known and respected figures of the last 25 years. We are interviewing Yasmin Abdel Majid, who is many things together. We got in touch with her because we read the special issue of the London Library magazine, where she's in the cover, front cover, for the 180th anniversary issue. So we read the article, then we went through one of her books, You Must Be Lila, which is a very interesting book, um, maybe not only for children, but also for grown-up children. And then we started becoming interested in uh, Yasmin's life and discovered many, many things. So we're going to go through this and find out who is Yasmin Abdel Majid. So good morning, Yasmin. Good morning. Lovely to meet you, Alan. Thank you so much. You're Sudanese, Australian, more or less, right? Because you were raised in Australia. Yes. And... Um, what is very interesting is very young, you were passionate by car racing. And later on, not much later on, you became a mechanical engineer, which was Indeed. not at the time very, very common in young girls. So can you tell me how come you were so passionate by cars and mechanics and all that? Yeah, thank you for the question. My first sort of love of cars. I'd always been interested in sort of science and finding out why things work the way they did. I come from a family of engineers. My father's an engineer. His father was an engineer. Most of my aunts and uncles are engineers. So the technical world was very familiar to me, you know, growing up and when I was in primary school and so on, was mostly interested in science. And then Quite funnily enough, I watched this film with my family when I was very when I was about 13 years old called Catch That Kid. I don't really recommend this film. It's kind of like the Italian job for children. You know, three kids, they rob a bank and they escape on go-karts. But I remember watching this kid drive on a go-kart really, really fast. And something about the image just sparked something in me. And I said to my mom, Mama. I want to be a Formula One driver. I was like, mom, I want to be a Formula One. I think that would be a great thing to do. And of course, my mom said to me like, yeah, 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 whatever. Because that's what you say to your 13-year-old daughter when she says that she wants to be a Formula One driver. But for some reason, that seed like embedded itself into my mind. And then I went on and started like reading about cars and borrowing all the books in the library and begging my father to take me to car shows. And it just blossomed into this love of a world. And I think ultimately what it was, was the love for a world that spoke of adventure and spoke of possibility and spoke also a little bit. There was part of it, I think, for me, which was also like a bit forbidden. I knew that people like me weren't really into motorsport. And so I loved also the playfulness of being in this world where people didn't expect and often knowing, you know, just as much, if not more, at least being very curious. Everything about it was exciting. Everything about it was an adventure. And I love speed. I love driving fast, running fast, cycling fast. And so that... Which is your favorite car? I mean, which was your dream car? So the dream car is... Not the fastest car, but the most beautiful car for me is the 1969 Corvette Stingray. There is something I have always wanted, sort of, it's like a C3 model Corvette Stingray. I think there's something incredibly beautiful about it. The car that I wanted to buy, the first car that I wanted to buy was like a Toyota Supra back in the, you know, in those like early 2000 days a twin turbo engine, you know, a Japanese car. It was all like lots of my friends had Supras and Honda Civics and Toyota RX-7, so like that kind of fast and furious era. You ever race? What ended up happening was, it turns out that being a Formula One driver is quite difficult and expensive. So I then went down the design route. So I ran a race car team where I designed the chassis. I was not the driver. I love driving, but I was never the fastest. I mean, you're only talking about very, very, very small differences um, between like the first and the last in a race, but I was sort of always somewhere in the middle of the pack. So I sort of, I put my mind more towards the kind of like the design of the car, but I always was, you know, racing my friends, 
legally or illegally, on the streets of Brisbane. In London, you have a special car? Sadly, in London, I I found it really difficult. Obviously, I was living in a, a small flat like most people my age. I signed up to a thing called Zipcar, which meant that I like had access to cars. But no, I didn't buy a car in London because it didn't really fit my life. And also, weirdly, most people I know don't drive in London, which is something super bizarre to me. They say that your mother insisted that um, your mother said that you something that it's in your Muslim faith, that you have to do the best of what you have, which means that uh, what is the best of what you have? Because your life has been quite... Unpredictable, right? I mean, after being an engineer, racing cars, working, if I'm not wrong, in gas and pipelines, go everywhere to double check pipelines with helicopters and things like that. Then you became very involved in social work. Then you went into other more humanitarian activities, right? Mm -hmm. How come? Yeah. So, I mean, I was doing both for a lot of the time when I was working as an engineer. I started an organization called Youth Without Borders when I was 16, and I ran that for nine years alongside being an engineer. What I ended up finding or what conspired was that the companies that I worked for no longer accepted. The more senior I became in these companies, the more they demanded that I couldn't do anything outside the company. And so ultimately they gave me a choice. They were like, either you do this social justice work and you do work that's related to your, you know, your morals, or you do engineering. In fact, a senior person in the company sat me down and he said, you're either you mean the engineer or you mean the individual. You can't actually be both. And to be honest, as much as I loved engineering, I thought that maybe I could do both. And I tried for as long as I possibly could. But eventually when I wrote my first book, The engineering like, company I worked for decided that that in their mind was too close to a breach of contract, even though I did not breach the contract. And so they gave me a disciplinary warning. They docked my pay. They docked my promotion. Um, and they benched me, essentially. And for me, I had been ranked the top drilling graduate for my region. I was very good at what I did. I was somebody who was on the, like put on a, a fast track within the company. But when they forced me to decide between following a path where I thought I was doing good in the world and following my love of engineering. Unfortunately, my love of engineering was no match for that. And therefore you became an activist, a television person, a writer. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I, I think I just did what was available and what I could find. And I think that like I have tried to make the best of the various situations I'm in. I've tried to look at what I think, you know, the various mediums I'm in are, whether it was television or whether it was writing or whether it was speaking or at this point, it's a case of figuring out what I can do and what I'm good at. And, you know, it's a very different stage to where I was maybe five years ago. There's a lot in life one can't control. And so you kind of have to look at and focus on what you can control and make the most of that. I don't want to be indiscreet, but in a certain moment around 2017 to 16, In the famous Anzac Day, which is the Australian uh, 4th of July, I mean, it's the most important day, uh, national day, you did some comments in television about the Sharia law and uh, you were attacked. What happened? What yeah, was I think you're conflating two separate occasions. So there was a, a discussion that happened on television in February of 2017 where a politician was essentially saying that we should ban Muslims. And I disagreed with her, obviously. And that sort of kicked off a media frenzy, um, trying to discredit me and attack me and so on. And then separately on Anzac Day, I posted on my Facebook page. So Anzac Day is a day where essentially it's a commemoration of a particular event in the First World War in Australia, but also a day where people commemorate, you know, fallen soldiers and so on. And on my Facebook post, That day I wrote, uh, lest we forget, which is the phrase that's used often. And then in brackets, I wrote Manus, Nauru, Palestine, Syria. So Manus and Nauru are the two kind of like prison camps where Australia holds in essentially an indefinite detention people that try to seek refuge in Australia. And obviously Palestine and Syria are Palestine and Syria. And my intention behind that post was to think, you know, on a day where we are trying not to forget those who have fallen, that's, you know, in the past, let's also think about who we should not forget today. 
And my post was not received in the way that it was intended. And even though I took it down like about an hour or two later and apologized unreservedly, uh, which people tend to forget, actually, um, it just became the the cudgel that I was then battered with for the rest of that year until I lost all my work, got many death threats, was called names and all sorts of things online. I mean, politicians spoke about me in Parliament. What did they ultimately reproach you? They said I was being un-Australian. They said I was ungrateful for what the country had given me and that why should I have opportunities and and why should I be part of the Australian public discourse? Because I was clearly somebody who disrespected the country. But how was the country vis-a-vis you? I mean, are the Muslims respected and live quietly in Australia or there were problems for you? I mean, I'm not responsible for all of the Muslims, so I don't really know how to answer that question. You are very religious yourself, very observant. I mean, I would say that being Muslim definitely informs my life, yeah. How does it shape your life as you mainly live now in Western countries? How do you feel? Are you feeling well accepted? You think that the world has made progress in integrating people of different kind of religions or you think we're not in a good time? Oh, I mean, this is a very big question, right? I mean, for me personally, Islam is the thing that gives me the structure and the foundation and the framework to how I move through the world. Like I wouldn't be who I am without Islam. So that's never been something that I've felt any consternation about. I was just curious of what being a Muslim in Australia and then in England now is for you. And if you feel well and understood in your book, the girl, Laila, I don't think she's you exactly because she's in England as a child, but she has to fight to impose what she is. She is to be accepted in the world of a very special school and it's not easy, but she's a bit like you, tough, determined, and slowly she becomes accepted and uh, respected. Yeah, I suppose in that context, to answer your question, I think that what is challenging about being Muslim in the countries that I've lived in, whether it's Australia or the UK or now in France, is that people engage with Muslim people from a politicized place that's often a place of ignorance, to be honest. And so well before people engage with you as a human being, as an individual, they come to the table, they come to an interaction with you with all of these assumptions and biases and prejudices. And so as an individual, you have to do so much work to bypass all of that before you then get to speak as human to human. And that I think exists at an individual level and exists at a, you know, institutional level. And I mean, obviously is informed by history, obviously is informed by, you know, foreign policies and so on and so on. But what I would say is that like, even at the the very basic level of finding characters in fiction books Uh, who are, you know, for example, young Muslim women, it's incredibly, I mean, it's different now to when I was young. But the reason I write these characters is because there's such a dearth of them in the English language. It's so difficult to find young women who are Muslim in books written from a position where they are, you know, proud of who they are, they're empowered. And for me, like, I grew up in a family of women who were very proud of who they were, who were very empowered and very, like, um, staunch. And so the my understanding of, of like who I am in the world that I come from is so different, so different from how others see me. And that dissonance, I think, is exhausting. Why you are in France now? You have just been appointed trustee of the London Library. Uh, yes. No, I'm in France just for a short while. I'm on a writer's residency at the Cité Internationale des Arts. So... Are you writing something new? Yes. So I'm writing my next nonfiction book, which is a book of essays. And I'm working on a play as part of the Soho Theatre Writers Lab. What essays are you writing? So the collection is called Talking About a Revolution. And it's a mix of my previously published essays, but also a number of new essays. And I look at the concept broadly around revolution through two different lenses. One is like personal and private and the other is like systems and structures. So my essays cover from like 
in defense of hobbies. So like in def- uh, an essay in defense of hobbies that are non-commercialized to writing uh, to an essay on like how my understanding of blackness has changed over time, depending on where I live to another essay in the systems and structures section on how I relate to the idea of prison abolition and what that means in like one's day-to-day life to an essay which I just finished working on about challenging the idea or problematizing the idea of citizenship and what does it mean to be a citizen and why is that the only way that we at the moment have access to rights in the society that, you know, in the... In, what are in, you? You are an English citizen? No, I'm an Australian citizen. And how come you became a trustee of the London Library? I mean, the London oh, well, Library I, I mean I've lived in, a I'm a resident of the UK, so I've lived in the UK for the last four years. I've had like 12 years of governance experience. You know, I was on the board of the Queensland Museum, the Queensland Design Council, the Council of Australian Arab Relations, the Australian Multicultural Council. I helped redesign the State Library of Queensland when I was growing up. So I've been involved in governance for a long time and I love the London Library and I'm a real proponent and really passionate about libraries and about bringing books and literature to as many people as possible. Um, and so I applied like is, everybody else. Libraries nowadays are um, less, I don't know if less important, but people go to Google as much as they can, you know, they use less libraries. And so why do you think they're still so very important nowadays? And what does the London Library mean? What is the London Library so special? I mean, you can't actually Google everything. Google gives you lots of answers, but it doesn't give you answers to a lot of things. The London Library has over a million books. It's got books that are like hundreds of years old. So from like a pure knowledge point of view, yes, you can look stuff up online, but there is something wonderful, I think, about having access to a curated form of knowledge as well, which is what I think a a library is. But also it's not just about the pure knowledge. It's also about the space. It's such a beautiful space. It's a space that is inspiring. And honestly, like it was one of the first spaces in London that I discovered that I found, you know, I wrote my second novel, Listen Leila. I wrote a lot of that in the London Library and I often go to it for like inspiration, sometimes not even knowing what I want to look for, but I'll walk up and down the stacks and I'll see a title or a name or something and I'll just, my curiosity will be piqued and I'll pull that book out and I'll be introduced to a whole new world that I, you know, never even knew existed. And what and are you going to do as a trustee? Is the library fully organized, for instance, for Muslim studies or Arabic studies? The library does have a lot of content around lots of different things. I have never written about Muslim studies per se, so I, I don't really know if it, if it has a lot of books in that area, like in terms of Islamic scholarship and so on. Most of my yeah. writing is in different spaces. I have borrowed a few books from the London Library about Sudan, though, which is, you know, something I'm interested in. But I mean, like, for me, being a trustee is about bringing the library to a whole new audience and also bringing the people that are my audience to the London Library, folks who are from different backgrounds, whether they're Muslim or Black or, you know, diaspora in different ways. A lot of them hadn't heard of the London Library. A lot of them weren't aware of, like, the Emerging Writers Program or the remote membership or all of these things that I think the library are doing to engage different audiences. And I genuinely think it's like such a fantastic place to be a part of, even to like get to know people in the membership and so on. I mean, you don't really know that spontaneity. I think there's something really wonderful in that. So I'm really passionate about connecting the library to different audiences. Also, being part of sharing the story of the London Library far and wide through, you know, digital media and so on, which is a space that I'm quite, you know, native to. Who are your favourite writers? Ooh, okay. Um, I would say in terms of the books that I go back to, I adore James Baldwin. I'm a big fan of the writing of Angela Davis. Um, Roxane Gay is an incredible writer. A friend of mine, I'm lucky to call this person a friend of mine, named Sophie Hardcastle. She's an incredible writer. I think there are folks who I'm still discovering. I think the kind of writing that I really enjoyed when I was younger, more in the fantasy and sci-fi space, perhaps I relate to differently now. I mean, I grew up loving authors like Tamora Pierce and Robin Hobb. But today, the people that I think are amazing are as much wonderful writers 
you know, the Tony Morrisons and so on, as they are thinkers and contributors, I think, to the kind of thinking that I'm doing today. Going back to the cars, obviously, you know that we're going through a big revolution in the world of cars, right? There is this big discussion, cars should be electric, cars should be hydrogen powered, and so on and so forth. Are you not interested to go back to your original love because we live in a very, very important moment of change? So what are your ideas about that? This is a tricky one for me because I think I'm like somebody that loves horseshoes at the time when Henry Ford was making the first automobiles in that I just cannot get excited about electric cars. I've driven them. I know that they're fantastic. I know their acceleration is amazing, but it's just not exciting to me. And it's like, it's something that I've really tried to get my head around. But like, I'm a mechanical engineer. I want grease. I want gears. I want petrol. I want the smell. I want the noise. I want the visceral experience. Electricity doesn't give me any of that. My father is an electrical engineer, and he tried to get me into sort of, you know, electric motors and all of this thing when I was a kid. And I was just like, right, well, this is pure power, like, great, but it's giving me nothing. There's no So you're not very sustainable in your mind. No, I'm I'm a terrible, I'm a terrible person. (laughs) I'm, I'm like, this is one of the reasons I don't own a car is because then when I do hire a vehicle and it's terrible for the environment, I think at least I'm hiring it just for a few days and not owning it. Yeah. In this particular thing in my life, I find it very difficult to transition. And what is your play going to be about? My play is about a group of organizers, like a, an activist group. Their main mission at the moment is one of their, the main character, Iman, her brother is in immigration detention and she's trying to help get him out. And it kind of follows the story of this group of people who are all united behind one particular cause, but they all have different agendas and they all have different kind of reasons for being there. And it's kind of a bit of a character study of what it's like to be a part of an activist organization, even though from the outside, it might look very cohesive inside. There's kind of a lot of turbulence and I'm not going to spoil it because there's a big twist at the end, but it begs the question of like, what does it matter who we are to the work that we do? You are an activist. You are an engineer. (laughs) Who are you? I'm Yasmin. I'm just some lady. I'm just some lady. Yeah, but if you did all this, you might be very vicious. I think I don't want to waste my life. I think that's the thing. And you said that my life is very unpredictable. I think for me, I, you know, I only get one of these and I want to live it as much as I possibly can. I'm hungry for life. And it's not necessarily about any particular quote unquote achievement as might be recognized by, you know, as what we might typically think of as achievement. But for me, you know, the quote that my mom, that I always come back to, my mom said to me when I was quite young, she was like, you know, one day your God will ask you, I gave you all of this opportunity. I gave you all of these skills. What did you do with it? Now you're going to be married? Oh, I am married. I am married, yeah. You have a child? No, no. You want to have children? I don't know. I think the jury's out on that one. You think you keep you want to keep on living in England or you will travel somewhere else? I mean, this passion for adventure, and where are you going to go next? I do not know. I think it's a really good question. I mean, my husband grew up, was born and grew up in London, so he's a Londoner. But I think he's open to some adventures. But uh, he's English. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I don't know. I think like, I will stay if if England will let me stay. But I also think that doesn't mean that I won't have adventures somewhere along the way. I mean, I just turned 30 this year, right? I've had a lot of adventures in the last decade. So I, I can only guess what kind of adventures, inshallah, that I'll be able to have in the next. So inshallah is the big word of your life. Inshallah is the big word. <laughs> okay, so we don't have any other plans. After you leave Paris, how long are you staying in Paris for? 
My residency is until October, inshallah. My book of essays comes out next year. I've also got um, another sort of non-fiction book for young people. My novels, You Must Be Layla and Listen, Layla, have been optioned for television. So I've been making them into scripts. So hopefully that'll kind of, I'm really kind of into writing for television at the moment or for screen. Um, so I'd love to see that being made into to TV and, and, you know, do a bit more work there. But beyond that, I'm not sure yet. I think for me, this time to spend so the, the place that I'm doing my residency is part of this big building full of other artists. And it's the first time that I've been able to connect with other artists and to think about my craft in a way that, you know, I studied engineering. I didn't think about my craft in engineering, right? That wasn't, that wasn't the way that I was trained. And so I'm really excited about this opportunity to think about writing as a craft and to, to then think about what's possible after that. What does it look like to develop, you never develop thought- my practice? You never thought about going back to Sudan or to your original country? or? Yeah, I mean, I went and lived in Sudan after I graduated for a little while with my grandmother. And I have always had one foot in Sudan. I was heavily involved as part of the diaspora during the revolution. I'm part of something called the Nala Feminist Collective, which is a pan-African women's collective looking at sort of empowering young African women and uh, sort of raising, like giving opportunities and doing as much as we can to secure a world that is free from violence for women in in the Pan-African community. And so I have always sort of been connected to Sudan and remain connected to Sudan. Living in Sudan for me is something that we, my partner and I have considered, it is much more difficult to do the kind of work that I do in Sudan, simply because that's not how things are set up. The infrastructure, electricity at the moment goes out for many hours of the day. The internet setup is, I mean, even to do Zoom calls and that sort of thing is the, the infrastructure isn't really set up for that. And so unfortunately, the kind of the kind of work that I'd want to be doing is a lot more difficult in Sudan. But it's definitely something that, you know, is always an option, I think, and is always something, even if I'm not there, being connected to to the nation is part of who I am, yeah. Yeah, you think that Africa is a big uh, issue for the coming years. I mean, there will be a lot of change. I think there will be a lot of change. I think there's incredible opportunity, but I think there are also some deep challenges, you know. Where, I mean, most of these countries became independent in the 50s and 60s. They're still in real periods of transformation. And the Sudan that my parents grew up in is, incomparable to the Sudan of today. And I have no idea what it will look like in another 30 years. But I do think that, you know, the average age of Africans on the continent is 20. And I think something, the average age of the leaders is like in their 60s. So there's this massive kind of like gap between the leadership and the population. And I think, you know, as these Africans get older, as they become more globalized, as they connect to the rest of the world, I think there's just we have no idea what we're in for, and I think it's fantastic. So that's part of your future adventure, right? Probably. I think so, yeah. I mean, one of the things that I'm thinking about, which I think would be super cool, so I'm in Paris at the moment, and I get to go to these amazing museums, and I want to somehow be involved in creating museums like the ones we have in Europe on the continent in Africa. I think you know, the ability to tell our own stories on the continent, to create our own narratives, to have the space and and also to be a place where people can come and learn about their own history. I think that would be amazing. I think some way of empowering people to tell their own stories through things like museums and other cultural places, I think would be, if that's somewhere in my future, I'd be pretty happy with that. You're not going to be a politician. I really hope not. Many people have asked me to, but I really hope not. I feel like I feel like power is very corrupting and I feel like the the system of politics itself makes it difficult for people to traverse it unscathed. I feel like there are a lot of things that need to be done. I haven't quite figured out if I think that politics is the way, is the only way to do those things. But, you know, the pure form of power that you get when you are a politician or when you're in, when you're in those sorts of positions, I think you have to work very, very hard to not be corrupted by it. Thank you very much, Yasmin, for this interview. <laughs> Thank um, you. I hope it was an interesting conversation for you. Yeah, it was. Was it for you? Yeah, definitely. Thank you very much. Thank Good luck. you. Alan Elkan interviews.